there was a protest in New York where he was saying Hamas crossed the border and kidnapped a bunch of hipsters. So they knew they took civilians. They knew that they attacked defenseless music festival and kidnapped people. And they were celebrating this. Do you think, or what do you think, actually, of what people are saying that uh, this has partially been caused by a weak Biden uh, Hmm. and wouldn't have happened under Trump? Yeah, I'm very skeptical of that. I'm very skeptical of that. I I think we have this tendency to want to blame ourselves for everything. Um, in my view, I'm not sure that Hamas is looking to Joe Biden as a cue of like when they should act or, or really looking to the U.S. president necessarily. Um, that said, you know, Joe Biden has been in many ways soft on Iran. In many ways, uh, people have argued Obama was soft on Iran, and obviously Trump wasn't. Trump was a huge critic of the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, to what extent has that enabled Iran to help Hamas? I'm not sure. I'm not really sure. You know, Iran has been helping Hamas regardless. Um, people are, are are saying that Joe Biden um, unfroze six billion dollars that uh, 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 that the Iranian regime now has access to. And money is fungible, so that may have enabled them to help Hamas more, which is possible. Um, and and uh, perhaps worthy of criticism. I think saying it's worthy of criticism is one thing. Saying that that enabled this specific attack and this attack wouldn't have happened without it, I don't think there's any evidence for that. I think that um, one argument that's been made, which might be true, is that Hamas chose chose to attack now in coordination with Iran because Iran and Hamas both want to kill the emergent peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel. So there's there's been um, lots of talks since ever since Israel made peace with Bahrain, the UAE. Uh, in Morocco uh, under Trump, the world has been waiting for Saudi Arabia to be next. Obviously, uh, you know Israel made peace with Egypt and Jordan uh, in the late 20th century, and Israel has has it's very important to Israel's foreign policy to make peace with as many Arab nations as possible. And there used to be the thought that first we have to make peace with the Palestinians before the Arab nations will accept us, and that's proven to be false. It's, it's, it's been shown that Israel can make peace with Arab nations without having resolved the issue vis-a-vis the Palestinians. And they want to pursue that aggressively. Um, Saudi Arabia has an incentive to be on good terms with Israel and America because that helps them become the leading power relative to their rival, which is Iran. Saudi Arabia and Iran are the two biggest players among Arab nations and their rivals. So Iran... Sunni and Shia. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Iran has every incentive to kill the budding peace deal with um, with Israel and, and Saudi Arabia. So one way of doing that is to create a war between Hamas and Israel so gruesome that the pictures of dead Palestinian children will circulate in Saudi Arabia and the Saudi Arabian government will not be able to make peace with Israel in that context because their populations will be siding with the Palestinians. So that is one, one theory about why now. Um, and uh, I think we'll, we'll know more in the coming weeks about to what extent that is true. How is it that parts of the progressive left were celebrating the pictures of dead Israelis, um, often LGBT communities who we know if they were under the Hamas regime would be killed immediately. Uh, also BLM, or at least BLM Chicago, I think it was, who came out you know, in support of, of these attacks. Um, how is it that they are able to square these things? Yeah, so I, I, haven't, I haven't seen anyone celebrating the pictures uh, in, uh, specifically. I, I have seen... Uh, there was a protest, I think, in New York, where 
uh, it may have been the Democratic Socialists of America uh, were you know celebrating the fact of the attack um, and the success of the attack. Which, okay, so you know one explanation is like you know have they seen have they seen what Hamas did, or did they just see a headline saying Hamas successfully attacked Israel? Have they seen the picture, the gruesome pictures of what was done to to women, right, to, to children? So I want to give a part of me wants to give them the benefit of the doubt and say they they haven't seen how barbaric what happened is, and that's the only reason that they could possibly, you know, have anything good to say. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I think that. Uh, there was one video where, you know, they were explicitly explicitly acknowledging. There was one guy actually, and I think it was a New York protest, where he was saying Hamas crossed the border and attacked and and kidnapped a bunch of hipsters at this music festival, and they were celebrating this. So they knew it was that they took civilians. They knew that they attacked a defensive, defenseless music festival and kidnapped people, and still were cheering. This is indefensible. I mean, it's indefensible. And the only reason those kinds of people care about this issue is because they they look at it as a black and white apartheid issue, essentially, where the, the Palestinians are like American blacks and the Israelis are like American whites. And so with that simplistic mindset, they say, well... Uh, I'm on the side of American black people against white supremacy. Why would I not be on the side of Palestinians against Israeli supremacy? And so I think they just graft their American mindset onto the issue and come up with a very uh, an inappropriate view of it, of, of the situation. Um, that's the only reason that I can explain why you know, someone on the American left would care so much in the first place about the Israeli issue and then come out uh, defending Hamas. I've got a very difficult question for mm. you that's going to force you perhaps maybe to say awful things. Mm. Okay. If you're Fantastic. Netanyahu now, yeah, if you're Netanyahu, you're Israel, you've just been attacked like this, what would, what would you do? Well... Yeah, this this is where I think it's helpful to look at the 9-11 lens, right? After 9-11, Americans were united in the attitude that we cannot negotiate with this. We must destroy it. That was a bipartisan consensus after 9-11. So, you know, if I'm Bush after 9-11 or Netanyahu after 10-7 my responsibility is is first and foremost to the security of my people right this is this is war and no country would accept an attack like this on its people without a brutal retaliation on the military force that carried this attack out um you you have to I mean, you have to punish this kind of an attack to such an extent that they don't contemplate doing it again. And this is when I made the point earlier about how many of our attitudes around sort of sympathy are a luxury of the secure. If you're not in a secure situation, I'm not sure you have the, the luxury of, of being timid or being... Uh, being weak, being seen as weak, right? Because when you're really surrounded by hostile people that want to destroy you, strength is the only signal that they will understand. Um, they, they won't understand humanitarian concerns or, or, you know, begging. They'll understand that they can't mess with you because you're stronger and because what will happen if they mess with you, is intolerable to them. You have to impose an inco a cost that is so intolerable to them that they don't 
contemplate doing it again, or at least not for a very long time. Now that, that may seem a brutal thing to say, but what is the alternative? Really, what is the alternative? It's, the alternative is being soft on your enemy and hoping that the mercy you show them will be reflected in kind. What evidence is there to expect that mercy will be reciprocated in this situation? What about Hamas's behavior tells you, well, if we, if we take it easy on Hamas, maybe they'll thank us and take it easy on us, right? This, this is the kind of thinking that you can only have if you are outside the situation, living in peace and security thousands of miles away, right? If you've, if you've experienced what, they, what they're doing to you, you understand that there's only, there's only one language Hamas understands and it's strength, and they have to be made to see, to see this and to suffer this. And that's the only way that they're not going to do this again. I think that ex existential threat, well, firstly, it's a luxury belief a little bit like certain people who, among the progressives who want to defund the police uh, when they live in areas that don't necessarily need uh, in intensive policing or extensive policing. Uh, it's, it's one of those kinds of things. Um, the existential threat that you mentioned, I think, extends even further than Israel and to Jewish people in general. And there's about, I'm one of them, there's 15 million of us in the world, which is an extraordinarily small number. Uh, you can compare that to Christians, there are 2.2 billion, and that's just believers, which gets us into more murky, complicated uh, ground. You know, I'm not a believer of Judaism, I'm an atheist, but uh, I, it shows up on my sort of heritage things when I've done that. And it says I'm 95% Ashkenazi Jew. So I've got this lineage. And that would mean that Hitler or a, a terrorist organization would have a lot of interest in, in murdering me despite my beliefs or uh, lack thereof. So for me, I go about thinking, okay, things are fine. I'm very lucky to live in the UK where I'm very safe. But things do happen. Uh, my sister goes to a Jewish school. She's got security outside like you wouldn't believe, like the amount of security that has to be there. They've just been warned not to wear anything that shows what school they go to, that kind of thing. And I'm always thinking that Israel serves as something of a deterrent to prevent any kind of Holocaust scenario from happening again to this very small number of 15 million people. I know a lot of people, when they hear things like that, start th they're thinking, yeah, but they're all rich and got the money and this and that. And that's another thing we can go into, or maybe for another day, it's extremely complicated. But Jewish people do, on average, tend to have more security blankets in that sense. And it makes sense that they would, or would try to do that whenever they can. But that didn't help at all with the Nazis. You know, they just stripped them of their money and business, businesses and things. So we're always aware, I suppose, like any minority, that something like that could happen again. And if Israel were to fall, the first thing I would be doing with my family is going like, what the hell are we going to do? I might, I might immediately think, okay, should we go to America? Is New York now maybe the safest place? Because it's the most, I don't even know what I would think, but it, I don't think I'd necessarily stay in the UK. Uh, certainly wouldn't think of about a place like France, Italy, uh, Eastern Europe, no way in a million years would those be safe places to go. So there's more at stake. And I'm, I'm saying that, I suppose, to explain... Um, a lot, a lot of people, there's a double standard that Jewish people have and that I have. And for years, we'll get people coming up to us and saying things about Israel and we'll consider that to be anti-Semitic. And I think, I think it is if they don't know us well and they're just saying, hey, you, what, if, you know, what about Israel? And we'll say, hey, I, I haven't even been to Israel. What have I got to do with it? It's just one country that happens to be uh, the Jewish state, the one Jewish state there is. And at the same time, it's so integral to our our safety and our existence and i think to negate that is a little bit cowardly uh a lot of jewish people do and they say oh israel i don't you know and it's like but those would be the people that would come to your rescue if you ever needed it again so it's a complicated crazy existential threat how do you feel uh the, do you do you actually feel that there's a level of anti-semitism in the circles you run in in the uk and uh if if not do you feel there is anti-semitism in other corners of the country i think there's anti everything isn't there mm -hmm. in, in, you know and, and I, i'm always really careful when i talk about it because i there is a tendency towards uh victimhood olympics you know that that a lot of people go towards that is the currency of the day some form of victimhood and it's just ridiculous because i i had 
uh, I got, you know, the piss taken out of me a lot at school for being tall, right? Just being this, that's a bad thing as well. <laughs> there were plenty of minorities as well. Uh, uh, but by the way, being tall is great. I love being tall, but I didn't when I was at school because everyone hates whatever they are at school and people can tell and they go for the thing that you don't like being. Um, and all, having acne and stuff like that, right? That was bad. That was that was really hurtful. I also get called things on YouTube, uh, anti-Semitic things, because people see my name as gold. Maybe I look a little bit Ashkenazi Jewish. I don't know. And people say things, um, particularly when I've gone on very right-wing uh, podcasts, or, or not very right-wing, but center-right. I went on Tim Paul. Um, and I was having a great time. And then I came home and I rewatched it with the live chat. And it's like every yeah. other word is Jew, yeah. Jew, and all this stuff. And that's the right. And it's easier for me, and I can only speak from my personal experience here, to discard that. Because I suppose I grew up just thinking of these people as just lunatics. That's just how I felt. And they're so, they're so distant from me. But having gone to uh, you know a nice high school and uh, college and these kinds of things... I was more likely to mix with people who were on the left and intellectually progressive. And that's a lot more painful when you get it from those people, at least in my experience, because everybody experiences it differently. So for me, um, an example would be a, a friend of mine I'm just thinking of who was just very what we would call woke. I know no one likes to use the word woke anymore, but just for ease of communication, very woke, progressive – they were very, very careful around making any kinds of jokes about any kind of minority or identity because identity is the thing at the moment that is sacred. But this guy would still say whenever we had lunch or whatever, he'd make a little little joke of like, you know, uh, are you going to pay for that? Are you going to be Jewish about it? Like that kind of thing. Um, and you can't really win because if you pay too much and you give a big tip, it's like you're being a flashy Jew. And if you don't <laughs> give enough, you're being a stingy Jew. So I've grown up with like, a mad complex about that. Like, I will never let uh, a situation arise where I owe a friend money. Like, even if it's like one pound or dollar, that ca that cannot be the case. I cannot let that person think for a second. And if I do, I'm I'm a mess. I can't sleep. I'm sending messages like, "Hey, man, I'm I'm paying you paying you back tomorrow. Just so you know, or I'll, as soon as I see you, have you got your digits so I can do the transfer like immediately?" Because I'm so. And then I'm thinking, God, the way I'm obsessing again, it's a Jew obsessing about money, uh, and so. So, yeah, that's the kind of thing uh, that goes on, particularly in London and progressive intellectual circles. Yeah. So, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I grew up in, in a very diverse situation, but also in a uh, town with a heavy Jewish presence. So I had lots of Jewish friends, lots of black friends and Asian friends. And I remember, you know, like, my Jewish friends taught me Jewish jokes and I made black jokes with my black friends and Asian jokes with my Asian friends. And it was, it was all pretty much in good faith. Um, at the time, you it's know, a beautiful way to grow up. Yeah, it is. I, 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 I don't, it's not really how most people grow up, but I think as I've gotten older, I realized what a blessing it was. I, I find it, you know, as I get older, it's, it's harder to, to form those kind of relationships with new people you meet, especially in the current climate, because you can't just like thoughtlessly make a joke necessarily. It really could hurt someone if you, if you didn't grow up with them and if you're just meeting them for the first time. Um, but I guess uh, I, I would ask you, you know, do you have, uh, first of all, have you been to Israel and do you do you have any family there that was uh, affected by this recent event? Mm. Yes, yes. I know, but I just I want to just also oh, sure. clarify about the friend of mine who was saying stuff about Jews. I would have found that funny. Uh, maybe it gave me a bit of a complex, but I had a complex about being tall. You know, I had to see a physio recently to finally sort that out because I was I was bending down so much with my neck to fit in with everybody else, particularly growing up. I also had a very mixed uh i was very fortunate to have that kind of mixed upbringing with everybody mm -hmm. but a lot of jewish people around me jewish people tend to be short as well um uh, and so do i think asians i don't know if that's actually across the board but there were a lot at my school like indian i'm talking about indian and uh bangladeshi pakistani uh shorter so i just didn't i wanted to be the same as everyone else my neck hurts from that so you get mm -hmm. a complex from everything that's what jokes do to you sometimes and I, I i the reason i was upset when this friend did it was just because we couldn't joke about anything else to do with anyone's identity mm -hmm. and that was the one he considered okay oh, which suggests to me that there's a hierarchy in his mind 
like so aside from the jokes this is a very real hierarchy in his mind where jews are the rich powerful people right. and it's punching up so i think that's why um i was offended by that i think we should be able to joke more i i think a lot about something john mcwater told me ages ago and i just i just love this theory about swear words and how they've changed over the years and uh, like cuss words i think did you say swear words in america yeah i don't know Kind of, either one yeah profanity yeah so um that it was initially the words you can't say hell um uh damn things like that which had a religious emphasis because religion was the sanctity of the day and that gradually moved over to the bodily functions as we had this sort of repressed conservative society so fuck shit ass uh, the C word, which the C word's an interesting one because if we weren't on a podcast, I would say it happily. In America, they don't say it so much. Um, and that's because it crosses over with the third tier, which we're in now, which is identity. And so that C word has misogynist. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, yeah, people think it's misogynist. And in the UK, we use it to, to describe men. So we don't have that same kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, we've moved on now to identity. So the only words where you would say the something word, you wouldn't actually say the word. We've got like the N word. Mm -hmm. We've got the F word for gay people, right? You mm -hmm. wouldn't say that now. Uh, there's a K word for Jewish people. A lot of people don't even know, but you just, you just wouldn't say that word. Um, and so it's, and, and the C word potentially. So it's really, really interesting how identity has just become that thing we cannot talk about, we cannot joke about. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really, really sad. And as I say, it was sad to me that this what this person who abided by those rules found it acceptable to do so about Jews and not about any other identity. It, it gave me an insight into what he really thought about Jews. As to your, your question about um, people in Israel, yeah, it's a weird one. So again, like I, I spent my whole life a little bit ashamed when I was younger because it did feel like, you know, if you're Jewish, you're doing this horrible stuff to Palestinians, you're doing this. And that's why I tried to distance myself. But I have uh, second cousins. So my mum's cousin moved out there. So they're there. They're in a lot of fear right now in Tel Aviv. Um, I have my aunt and uncle were just there on holiday uh, vacation just last week. They were just trying to get out. So they were stuck there. And it was very, very scary just thinking about it while you know, they weren't allowed to leave the house. There's there's air raid sirens and things going on outside, you know, which is scary, makes you think of world, world wars. Um, and they had to wait and try to get to the airport. And the whole time you're thinking, well, you know, what the airport's a very dangerous place to be, you imagine. Of course, Israel has this defense system and the Iron Dome, but it was, it was breached. Um, so loads of airlines were canceled. And I understand that. What pilot wants to fly into Israel at a time like this? And it took days and days and days. And luckily, just this morning, uh, my aunt and uncle were finally able to get out. And then there's my fiance's family. She has loads of second cousins and things like that, uh, maybe even first cousins who are out in Israel. She's been to stay with them. They're incredibly welcoming, lovely people. And they've lost uh, loved ones, friends of theirs. And so in my house this last week, and it's, it's not often that geopolitics really comes into my home in any way. And the last week's been a really, really difficult time where I've been trying to lift my fiance up and also starting to do live streams on YouTube about this situation because it's important to me that the average person, not that they side with Israel or against Palestine or against Hamas, well, against Hamas they should anyway, but I want them to understand almost that Shakespearean thing of if you cut me, do I not bleed? I, I have this feeling that I've had my whole life. It's, it's probably a victimhood, stupid thing I have, but it's there that people think I'm a lizard person because uh, of some of the conspiracy theories and stuff like that. And they want them to know like, hey, we're hurting. We're real people as well. We don't get any joy out of Palestinian deaths. When there is an attack on Palestinian people, when that has happened over the years, my family and I do not sit there celebrating. We sit there mourning for those people and for the reaction that is going to come out in the press and how people are going to see us even more like these horrible uh, uh, attackers. So it's, it's never a good feeling. And that's the weird relationship we have with Israel, a country which I did visit many times. I did one of those uh, uh, tours that you do when you're 16 um, and went around the country and I, you know, I was I was a rebellious child, so I didn't want to listen to anything they were saying, and I felt like they were trying to brainwash me and all this stuff. But it was a beautiful country uh, with beautiful people. I find them a bit rude sometimes, <laughs> Israelis, but th that's maybe sort of Middle Eastern, different culture to, yeah. to British and maybe American. But yeah, that's that's my strange relationship with Israel. Yeah, no, I I kind of noticed the same thing when I was there that I called the concierge of the hotel for something. And there was just none of yeah. that kind of politeness culture. It was just like, 
no way. Yeah, what do you want? And I was like, excuse me? They, they've got no time for that. <laughs> yeah. it, just, it doesn't even enter their mind. Yeah. And especially being British, for me, I, although I find Americans actually even more so, you guys are really polite, especially in, in staff positions, maybe because of the tipping culture. But whenever I've been there, everything's like, you know, hi, sir, how can I help you? And I'm like, oh, wow, look at these lovely people. Israel, yeah, they just push you out of the way. They don't hold the elevator door for you. They don't do that stuff. It's just not in their culture. But they're also very warm and lovely. I think this is probably true of many... Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, stereotype or anything, but many sort of hot countries uh, with these beautiful traditions and beautiful family members and things like that. Beautiful family traditions where they don't quite have the same uh, priorities around what we think is polite. Right. Okay. So one of the big sticking points with uh, Jewish people in the West is a question of whether or not Jews are white. Some, uh, so, so one thing to realize here is just the vast majority of Jews in America are Ashkenazi Jews, which means that these are Jews that have been living in places like Poland and Ukraine and, and Russia for hundreds of years before migrating to, to America, um, you know, sometime in the past 150 years. And so often don't look distinguishable very much from Polish people or Russians or, or, or so forth. Uh, and then there are, there are Jews that have been living in the Middle East for the past hundred years uh, in places and, until they were expelled and, um, and moved to Israel, most of them. Places like Baghdad and Cairo had Jewish populations and they look Middle Eastern. Um, and obviously there were Jews in Spain as well and Morocco and so, uh, you know, when you go to Israel, you see lots of Ashkenazi Jews who look quote unquote white, but you also see lots of Arab Jews who don't, who are not, you're not actually able as an outsider to distinguish them from Arab Muslims. At least I can't. So how do you relate to the question of, you know, whether Jews are white and, and how do you sort of think about that? I think this, the saddest part of it is this has become something that I increasingly have to think about. And growing up, I didn't think about it. And that's fortunate because, I mean, it's this word that is, is uh, used a lot, but you pass. As a Jewish person, you pass to, to, to an extent, right? I mean, people know gold is, is a Jewish name, um, especially anti-Semites. They know. My dad's name was Goldstein. He changed it because of uh, the kinds of anti-Semitism he was getting. So we changed it to gold, but a lot of other people did the same thing, and it's still quite clearly a Jewish name. As I say, my sister goes to a Jewish school. I didn't. I didn't want that to happen. Uh, but a lot of the religious schools, when they're free schools, are just better in many ways. They have better uh, education and teachers and things in various religions, at least in the UK. Um, so I never thought about this, and now because of this obsession with identity and identity politics, we do have what I was referring to earlier with this kind of hierarchy. That's the only reason it would really matter in public discourse i think is a jew what am i what am i the same as another white well i don't know my family are from poland and russia and ukraine some other white person their family is from scandinavia and maybe from england and well, maybe i'm the same as them in, in that respect then it opens up this whole issue about what is jewish and what it means to be jewish and every time i talk about anything like this i get so many comments from people who are well-meaning and they're just well some are well-meaning and some are not but well-meaning just saying hang on, you're an, you're an atheist Jew, that doesn't make sense, it's an oxymoron, it's a paradox. And I try to explain that, to me at least, there are several different aspects to, to being Jewish. You might, it would be more helpful if they were different words, mm. because they just are totally different things that are somehow intrinsically linked, but separate. One of them is Judaism, the religion, that is a belief system. Um, I have little interest in it, although I did grow up uh, reading Hebrew, I didn't know what it meant, but I could read it. I had a bar mitzvah, um, I have a lot of Jewish family and friends who are involved in some ways in the religious aspects. Then there's the culture, which intertwines with it. There are a lot of people who don't believe in God, for example, or anything like that, but they like to get together for Passover uh, and have some of the Jewish traditional meals, like any, you know, like uh, maybe some Greeks would do. A, a minority of Greek people in the UK or people of Greek lineage would get together maybe and, and, and enjoy some of the stories and these kinds of things. 
And then there's just, I don't know if you call it ethnicity or lineage or race. Nobody seems to be exactly sure. And it's a really sticky point. I know that, again, from doing the My Heritage stuff, that I've got 95% Ashkenazi Jew. I think 5% was Iberian. So that would be Spanish or Portuguese. Um, and I don't know anything about that. I know very little about my history because most Jews, uh, when they their families moved over, mine moved over to the UK in something like 1901, their names were changed their documents were thrown away. They wanted to assimilate. So I have no idea. Like, I, I know that they're from certain places like Ukraine. So uh, am I white? I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm white, but I also feel like um, I have to worry about certain things that um, most white people, particularly in the UK, it's such a small percentage of people are Jewish, you know, uh, most white people don't have to worry about. Um, and, and then I, I would never want to tr even compare that to what a black person goes through, what an Asian person goes through, because they're all different and it depends on so many different factors. So I guess the long answer to that is, or the short answer to that is, I, I don't actually, I don't know, but because of identity politics, I'm feeling increasingly not white, which I think is, in a sense, a shame. Yeah, I mean, there's one dynamic where, in a way... If you're a Jew, if you're Ashkenazi Jew, you would, you would, uh, you you might want to in the oppression Olympics be seen more as Jewish as opposed to white because you know if you're on say a college campus in America, the worst thing that you can be is a white person. That means you are the yeah. oppressor. Uh, you have actually the lowest status in in the local status hierarchy that certainly is how it was when i was at columbia and if you're if you're black like me like visibly so then you're automatically higher than a white person but if you're jewish you're in this weird in between because you look white yet you don't you can't be put in the historically white category right the reason that white is low status is because you know, Europeans were the colonizers. And if you're Jewish, you know, you have all of these sort of cards to play in terms of the oppression Olympics, right? You can play the Holocaust card, which is, you know, in this weird kind of social status hierarchy is a really strong card to play. But then other people may swat you down and say, well, look, you look white, you have white privilege, so actually your low status, right? This is intersectionality, the culture of intersectionality. And it, it's whenever I talk about it, there are certain people that it just, it sounds alien because it's not, it, it's not the culture where you live. But I guarantee you, if you go to an Ivy League school or an elite college in America or an elite high school, intersectionality is how social status is sort of doled out. So I'm curious if, do, do you feel that at all? Do you feel like there any situations where you being seen as a Jew, as a Jew would heighten your status as opposed to being seen as white? Um, I tried it. I tried to use it. And, and, you know, it was that kind of, if you can't beat them, join them. Uh, so I started my career, I was making video documentaries where I was going around to different cultures and places because I'm fascinated with, with different cultures. I went to learn languages, so I speak five languages. And I was living in Argentina, Brazil, Germany, different places. And I made these videos about uh, exorcist, an, an exorcist who's a, who's a lunatic and uh, looking for UFOs, stuff like that. And I managed to get one sold to the BBC. You don't, it doesn't usually work like that. Usually the BBC have to commission it and they give you the money and you go and make it with them or with the production company who works with the BBC. But they just weren't interested in me. I tried a million times. And look, why should they be? You know, not, not everybody has a right to just be a BBC TV presenter. So fair enough. So I went and made it myself with my friend David, this exorcism documentary. It was like an hour long TV documentary. And it took two years and I sold it to the BBC. I pushed them every day on LinkedIn, finding all the people at the BBC, whatever. Got it eventually sold to them. It won festival awards. It was in their best of 2018 list. It was like doing really well. 
So I thought like, well, okay, finally, after all these years of pushing and pushing and doing it myself and trying to do everything, I'm going to be able to do this and be this TV guy. I used to love this guy called Louis Theroux or Theroux in American. He's the son of Paul Theroux, the travel writer, the cousin of Justin Theroux, who, who's an actor who married Jennifer Aniston. Uh, and he does these kind of documentaries and he's a big English TV presenter and documentary maker. It's what I wanted to be. Um, so I then went to various meetings with the BBC and then the BBC would sort of suggest production companies that I talk with and I had an agent. So she put me in with these production companies and I came in with my ideas. And these were these mad ideas about uh, a an indigenous tribe in Bolivia where they put people in ant hills. They have to put their feet in ant hills and get bitten if they commit adultery. Just stuff like that. I thought this is going to be an interesting documentary, anthropolo anthropological kind of thing. And... I would see people just nodding and nodding, like, wow, because because most of the ideas they were getting were just stuff in England happening. Mm. And they were going, what, you've got access to this? And I was like, yeah, I've got the people, I've got their phone numbers, I've spoken with them, I've got the, for the whole series, there's going to be 10 episodes of different kinds of weird stuff. And they were going, wow, this is great, this is great. And every production meeting I had with all different producers around the UK, probably 50 to 100 of these people, every single time there came a point where they said, listen, we do have to talk about something that's a little bit difficult here. And I would say, okay, well, you know, what's that? That's why I said at first. Now, eventually, I knew what they were going to say. And my friend David was in these meetings with me, so he was witness to this. And they would say, unfortunately, we do want your ideas, but you're going to have to be off camera. You can't be, like, on the camera talking to people because we need somebody who is from a minority background to be on the camera, to be shown, to be visible. This is not going to go to the BBC and certainly not to Channel 4. Uh, which is the other big channel here, and, and even more progressive. Uh, it won't, you know, it just won't with you as a white man on the screen. So that was really uh, at first. I was still young and I didn't understand all this. And this was at the the dawn of the very new kind of identity politics that we have. So really, I felt quite uh, a bit of a um, a hero, you know, because I'm I've got an ego like everyone else. And I felt like, hey, I'm doing a good thing here. Maybe we'll get some minorities to be the presenters of my journalism and I can hide behind it and pretend it wasn't me. Or, you know, I, th I felt good about myself. I, I don't even know how or why, but I did. And then as it went on, I thought like, I need to um, pay my bills. <laughs> like, I've got no money and I don't know how I'm going to live. And okay, I can get a job somewhere. Of course I can. But this was what I wanted to do and I knew I was good enough to do it because they were telling me I was, but I had to be off screen. So... I started to really resent it mm. and I became really, really resentful. It's part of why I started the podcast. Initially, my podcast was a bit more anti-woke mm. and then I sort of moved away from that into more cults and human behavior and different kinds of things. But it, it was all the James Lindsay's and the, mm. uh, these kinds of people were, were on. And, it, you know, because I was so angry about it all. And I did try and say a few times um, when they said that, I said, well, you know, like I'm Jewish. That's a, that, that is a minority. And I felt so ashamed mm. to say it because I felt like I was trying to get a job because of my lineage, because my great-grandfather was in a bad situation. Like, what the fuck has that got to do with me today? And I felt like shit saying it. But a guy just, I remember really, really vividly, it stuck with me. One guy, he just sort of laughed and he said, like, well, if I said what I really think about that, I don't think you'd be very happy. Mm. And that was it. So in that wow. sense, Jew did not help. Mm -hmm. At the same time as all of this, I am aware there are a lot of Jewish people in, particularly in America, in show business, in the media. There are a lot of white people, white men in the media, in these kinds of things. So I, I do get aspects of all of this. There are not many Jewish people on British TV. It's, it's very different being a, a British Jew to an American Jew. But that was it. That, that was the moment when, when I got laughed out of there. That was the moment I was like, right, well, fuck this. I, don't, I just don't need this like mainstream... TV that's enthralled to some sort of weird anti-racist uh, campaign. Yeah. So what what do you think the difference is between being an American Jew and a British Jew? American Jews, um, I think American Jews probably don't realize how fortunate they are in many respects. Or maybe they do. I think they do realize it from people I've spoken to. Um, firstly, because they're, they're far more numerous, I think, than in the UK, even if the percentage is relatively low, the percentages in some of the places like Los Angeles and New York, uh, is, is a little bit higher. I mean, in London, in the UK, it's still like 1%, I think it's a really small amount uh, of people, a small number of people. Secondly, 
Judaism has been able to infiltrate the culture in a way that it hasn't in the UK. In the UK, there is this kind of, uh, I don't mean to suggest the UK is more racist because I don't actually think it is. I just think that it has this kind of old guard. Mm. And if you want to get into it, you know, we'd call it WASP or is it, yeah, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Is that what it yeah. is? WASP? Yeah. So very waspish, very uh, Gatsby. I know that's an American reference, of course, but um, old, old school, old money, that kind of thing. Um, so the way that Seinfeld was able to permeate the culture in America is just there's been no equivalent in the UK like that. I don't feel like that could happen. There have been a few attempts by various comedians, but it, it couldn't. They, there couldn't be a language like the way bits of Yiddish have have gotten into American uh, speak mm -hmm. or speech. You know, there's no like yeah, yeshmaka. You know, a lot of not non-Jewish people in America use those mm -hmm. words. Seinfeld, Larry David, Mel Brooks, uh, Woody Allen. It just all of these Jewish people who have managed to completely... Uh, Sarah Silverman, Ben Stiller, Adam Sandler. Mm -hmm. It just the, the list is like never-ending in, in a sense because it's something that was just big for them and important for them and it was a big part of their culture. In the UK, there's a little bit more of a, you know, keep your head down, don't let people know that you're any different, that you have horns or anything people might think. You know, when I went to university up in Leeds in the north of England... Um, and this is not, I'm not having a go at Leeds by, by any means. It's just there, there are people everywhere who are, who are maybe ignorant or whatever. But I did get a lot of people saying then, you know, have you got, oh, I thought you would have horns. And, uh, oh, why aren't you coming out with us tonight? You're going to be studying the Torah and stuff like that. They would be saying to me. So, it, yeah, it's just a little bit more alien here and a little bit more keep your head down. Plus, the UK is slightly more to the left, I think, than America, uh, generally in politics. I think, you know, the Labour Party here is a little bit left of Democrats. The Conservative Party is a little bit left of Republican. Uh, and it means that I think there's even more social clout for that kind of oppression Olympics, uh, of which the Jews are, are generally not considered uh, very high up. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. It may have something to do with just the general fact that America is more of an immigrant-friendly place yeah. and we haven't defined ourselves ethnically in a very long time um and you know a place like new york has been just you know if not a melting pot then a salad bowl of all kinds of different people and so in some way it would make sense that that jews like any other immigrant group just seeped into the culture more i mean i think italians have seeped into the culture so much in america um, Irish people have, have seeped so much in, into the culture in America and contributed so much and groups have been more willing to sort of take and give and in this way in American culture most European country, countries just haven't had that they've been defined by their ethnicity yeah it's really interesting about Italian Americans because I'm thinking I immediately have an image in my head. I've seen The Sopranos. Mm. I've seen The Godfather. I know that those ha those are part of derogatory stereotypes. I know that that's not how most Italian Americans are, of course. But I know what an Italian American is. Mm -hmm. I don't know what an Italian Brit is. Mm. I don't know what an Ita Italian English. That's just an Italian. That's just some guy who's Italian. Right. And if some guy who's Italian comes here and has kids, they're just English kids, and they say, "Hey, you know, my dad's Italian." I go, "I don't care." And it's just I don't know why that is exactly. It you know it just it just seems to be. The, the way it is. and in, in some respects it, it might be a good thing i mean it's you're just who you are you're you but when there are if there are a bunch of people who hate italians if there are a bunch of people who hate jews i think you're less protected in the uk because of that for some reason this interview continues go and watch it right now coleman's one of my favorite youtubers just click here this will be this square hopefully right here go and watch the other part of the interview on coleman's channel and hit like on both of them share them around and keep on watching